of talk about the changing retail landscape lately with uh, the rise of online shopping and increasing competition for shoppers time um, and locally some retailers are talking about how they're really struggling not just to attract customers but even employees and to have the employees find parking in the area so um, so today we're going to talk about retail changing retail um, we're going to talk about shopping centers what individual stores are doing and then take a look at um, our downtown shopping areas. Um, Sue, I, you know, we hear a lot about the threat of online. Um, can you just give us a little idea of, of how big is digital shopping these days and, and what are people facing? Well, you know, there's, there's this sort of a disconnect between the reality and, and what you're hearing anecdotally. And I think a lot of times anecdotally you hear about stores will tell you, uh, you know, pro uh, shop owners will say, it's definitely affect affected my sales and it probably has. Um, and one of the hardest things is that they see someone coming in with their digital device and doing a, a price comparison and then mm -hmm. trying out the product and then walking out and buying it online. Yeah. At least this is what they say. Mm -hmm. This is what the theory is. In reality, I think there's something like uh, um, retail sales online only kind of for about 8.9% of retail, of all retail sales hmm. in the second quarter of 2017, and that was from the hmm. um, uh, consumer department for the um, uh, census, the U.S. Census hmm. gathered that information. And, so it's less uh, than 10%. Yes, but oh, also, sense. on the other hand, um, some international um, retail associations have found that there is something like, there is a real looming threat in that there's been a five-fold increase or over um, brick and mortar openings, let's say, mm -hmm. of uh, new uh, e-retailers. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing lots and lots of people getting online to sell their products. Yeah, it's easy to open a retail But it does seem to me there's a big difference between different kinds of retail, because obviously like a restaurant wouldn't be displaced by an internet or like, um, are they talking about particular kinds of retail? Are we just talking about like bookstores and electronic stores and things like that well, yeah, because yeah. Cause if it's just that small segment eight to nine percent could be pretty significant well I think yeah I think it really does depend once again on on where what we're talking about and the certain sectors have been hit a lot harder than others we all know about bookstores maybe we mm -hmm. don't all know so much about um, clothing retailers you know that's another one I mean now we're even seeing like toys toys R Us is in trouble I just heard on the radio this morning they're facing possible bankruptcy right. So, you know, there's, there are a lot of segments, I'm sure there's a lot of electronic devices, you know, the tech sector probably there's a lot that people can also purchase online. So, the, the, like the, re the reason I asked is because the city has been talking about protecting retail for like a few years and have taken some actions and instituted new laws. And the more this discussion evolves, the more I realize that people are talking about different things. And as the council mm -hmm. keeps working on these things, the definition of retail keeps on changing. Yep. Like both in how they talk and how it's actually written in the code. And so you get a lot of people asking, wait, is this retail or auto services retail or yoga studios? And it gets to a point where a yoga studio in University Avenue is retail, but, yeah. but on Hamilton it's not. So it gets really, really confusing. It's like a, it's one of those things. Everybody supports retail until you keep asking, well, what exactly what is do it? you support? Yeah. So, well, I think that's the thing. We're in, a, we're in a phase right now where it's really a moving target. And I, I just don't think that, I think that the whole way people are, doing, are shopping, the way people are looking at retail, and what's going to be out there for the future is, is really going to be changing. One of the things that I've noticed, like for example, just going into a grocery store, okay? You go into Safeway, have you noticed how much smaller their paper product section is? You go in and you try to find, it used to be an entire aisle of, let's say, toilet paper and paper towels and so on and so forth. It's very, very small. It's really shrunken. Well, I don't think people are buying most of their paper towels online, but they are going to Costco and buying in bulk. So I think that mm -hmm. um, whatever store it is you're talking about, there, ha whatever offerings you're going to see, you may see what you used to see out there, it's going to be shrinking and it's going to be much more specialized. And it seemed like in the story that retailers are actually mixing services now in their business and you talked about experiential, is that, yeah. that's that right? Yeah, this is like, there, is there, there are some new buzzwords out there. There's yeah. experiential, there's retailtainment is another term. Okay. Omnichannel. Omnichannel. Okay. You know, things I have trouble pronouncing, frankly, <laughs> much less grasping the concepts of what they are. 
But essentially what it is is you really have to have, you know, that old song about uh, you got to get a gimmick if, if you want to have a chance, basically. And, and essentially, uh, you know, um, that's what's happening is that you have to have a draw that is not just the product anymore, but a reason for people to come and make your place a destination place to come to. In the story, you talked about what some of the smaller independent retailers are doing to stay competitive. So, um, um, like the the chocolate place, tell me what they're doing. Okay, yeah, the chocolate place is really interesting. This is uh, Timothy Adams Chocolates on Bryant, and um, they, I mean, they have a really nice little vibe in their store, and they and they have uh, you can get I think you can get sandwiches there now too, but they have chocolate and they have um, wine and all kinds of things that you can you can get, but. It hasn't been enough in, it, to expand. What they did was they started offering chocolate tastings. They offer classes, and not only in store, but they will go out of the store to do it. So, if Stanford is having some kind of a party, they'll go and they'll do a chocolate tasting for fifty-five people. You they know, should so. have come here with us yes, today. Yes, yes, <laughs> they should have them here. Bring their samples. So. Um, uh, so that is just, and they, they are busy every single day of the week. They've got a whiteboard in, in their uh, prep area where it's just got, you know, Tuesday is 15 people, Wednesday they're having 30, you know, just, just this is just all for the classes. So I think, and also, you know, the, they're open, they extended, the other thing I don't think I put in the story is that they've extended their hours. So they're not looking at being just a uh, nine to five store. They're open nine o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, because they're taking advantage of the date scene. So they're becoming a destination place for people to come and have, you know, after they've gone to their movie or even after dinner to go there for, for dessert or just to come and chat or let's, you know, let's meet and, and have our glass of wine and our, or our chocolate and wine pairing or whatever. So they've really uh, done a, a very big increase. I think they said something like it increased their business by like about 30, 35 percent or something like that. And they're also looking at, they've been now sought out to actually open a, a facility. It won't be, it'll just be a retail shop, but at San Jose International Airport. So the city of San Jose is also looking to beef up its little retail centers. And this is, they're looking at Timothy Adams as, as a possibility. I feel like it's a little easier to do an immersive experience like that if you're dealing with chocolate and wine. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're like your basic like clothing store and you're facing like a competition from the internet. Uh, yeah. How, how can you kind of replicate this kind of experiential experience? Are there any like clothes shops that are trying to do the kind of thing? Fashion. I don't know of anyone in particular, but my understanding from talking to this, uh, to people within the city is that it's basically they're having like fashion shows. So you might bring in a particular uh, designer or, you know, have a focus on a particular line of clothing that, that's very popular. Those types of things are things that people are doing. Um, I'll give you an example of a store, I believe it's, I'm going to say it's in Burlingame. Uh, they have, it's like a skateboarding store, it's either Burlingame or, or um, San Mateo. But what they do is, is they, they're known just for bringing out, you know, innovative products. So whenever something new comes in, they're the first ones to have it. And so they'll have it there and they'll have like a happening around it, similar to what Apple has always done with their products, you know, mm -hmm. so, you, so you just, they, they just create buzz around whatever it is that they, they're going to have, and that's how they're, they're beating out um, online. But let's just also say that when I talked to Russ Cohen over at the uh, business, the downtown uh, business improvement, uh, excuse me, not business improvement, the uh, business profession association. Yeah, yes, right. thank you. Mm -hmm. can, can, can keep you straight. But, uh, he was saying it's never going to be enough just to do one thing. So this is where the so-called omni-channel comes in. And in that case, you've got to basically be able to do many things. Today's retailer has to have an online presence, has to have a very good social network, has to be pushing uh, out product and, uh, let's say, coupons and discounts and events and things uh, to their clientele. You've got to have reasons to be getting people to come into the store and you know so these are that's just another way that they're they're doing this type of thing do you see a difference between um, like downtown shopping districts and malls what they're doing or 
Is the strategy the same? Uh, it's kind of interesting because they, 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 I, I think there's a, there's a similar theme and what you're seeing is just sort of on a much larger, more cohesive scale for the uh, shopping centers or malls. And the reason is that they have so much more control. You know, uh, an individual uh, working a mom and pop retailer has a very limited ability to really influence, you know, their entire district, although they can if they all get together and work together. But when you've got a shopping mall, you know, you've got a head, basically, who can sort of set the tone for things. So what you're seeing now is you're seeing as they redevelop, they're adding bowling alleys, they're adding a lot of movie theaters. I think it's kind of interesting that the Stonestown Galleria in San Francisco, you know, one of the things they're doing is they're going to knock down their Macy's and put in, you know, they're proposing putting in uh, 12 uh, cinep- you know, little movie theaters in there, food, you know, food courts or whatever, restaurants, high scale restaurants, beverage places, that, and that sort of thing. You have that also in um, Santana Row is, a, is an example of that's been highly touted as, as a really successful model. Did they know that movie theaters are also facing the same kind of problem? From the internet, they haven't said that yet. But you know, but this is the this is the we'll, problem. We'll be writing about that in a few years. Okay. Well, this is the problem with any any sort of trend that people try to follow, and I think that um, experts, basically, who talk who know about retail, say you really better be prepared not to just jump on the bandwagon, but you've got to have diversity. It's just like investing in the stock market. We throw everything all in one stock, and then it tumbles, you know, that, well, you've lost everything. So, so I think one of the interesting thing. things about Santana Row is that the person that you interviewed there um, said that, you know, doing this mixed use development, mm-hmm. so they've got not just the retail, but they've got the office space, they've got the residential and all those, those two office and residential built-in customers, you know, they feed right in. And we see that happening at Valco, in Cupertino, we see that happening in Sunnyvale as well. But what's interesting to me is that neither uh, Stanford shopping center nor town and country here, you know, have those additional um, uses. Right. And, and they're, just, they're just throwing money really at, at the retail and just kind of coming up with our own um, kind of formula. It's based on events, you yeah. were saying. Yeah, they're having many more events. Dining yeah. brings people yeah. in. Yeah, and I think the other thing that people are doing in, in these malls is they're being really strategic about who they're letting in. So, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember Woolworths that used to be over at Woolworths. At, at Woolworths, <laughs> Woolworths used to be over at, at Stanford Shopping yep. Center, right? Sure did. And that would have been considered an anchor store back in the day. Mm-hmm. And it's not anymore. I mean, they don't, they don't even exist. I think, they, I understand, it was like mm-hmm. Foot Locker or something. But they bought out Foot Locker or something, mm-hmm. but they changed their whole model. At, at any yeah. rate, bottom That's line fun. is, is that now what they're doing is, you know, the little places that you used to see there that you would frequent are not there anymore, and now you've got more upscale stores, mm-hmm. more specialty, and, you know, it's like it's almost intimidating sometimes <laughs> to go to the mall because you just see, you know, everything sort of glitzy and gold and chrome and so on and so forth. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, it's not it's the like, mall that we grew up with. No, it's dress not, up to go shopping. Uh, exactly, <laughs> you know, and, and but, but this whole idea of making a, a destination place Stanford, for example, they they have many events, you know, they and they or they may partner with nonprofits to mm-hmm. have different programs as well. Yeah. It's not just Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny anymore. Right. You know, and the whole jazz series during the summer. Right. Mm-hmm. And the other well, thing. I just want to mention, like, to, to Jocelyn's point about mm-hmm. mixed use and housing, mm-hmm. I think the College Terrace Center thing proves that that's not always a completely winning formula. I mean, that's mixed use, but. Just, Maybe just, because just it's because on such a small it. scale. But it's on a it's, small scale. And the other, yeah. the other thing I was going to say is that the there's, theory was, yeah. there, there is, there's uh, Michael Byrne, who I spoke to, who's a uh, Berkeley uh, retail <laughs> specialist, and is doing consulting for the city of Redwood City. Redwood City is a good example of a city that really has, you know, expanded. I mean, they, they're gone great guns. What have they done? First, they started out with their... Um, you know their whole happenings, their their arts and entertainment at, on the plaza, mm-hmm. that really drew people to downtown. That used to be called it was always jokingly Deadwood City, right? <laughs> but suddenly became the happening place. They put in movie theaters, which at first I was really lamenting when I used to go down there and say, "Oh no, they've taken out the retail." And they, what are, what are they crazy putting in these movie theaters? And look, it worked. It's become a draw. 
So they have this vibrant downtown center to the point where they're starting to have to scale back on some of the, the things that they're doing because it's interfering with their retail businesses. For example, they do consider, uh, let's say, the, uh, the Fox Theater retail, a retailer in a certain sense that they, you know, it's a small business. Mm. But when they have uh, some movie night or something on the plaza on a Friday night, that really cuts into, the, you know, the Fox can't do their thing. So they're looking at maybe moving more of their events to the middle of the week now that they know they've got people coming down there all the time. It's interesting to think about what cities can do. Uh, you were mentioning before, the control that a shopping center has is complete. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it plans the events, it knows who's gonna come in, it can control the rents. Um, but then you have cities and downtowns um, particularly, and you know they have from Palo Alto on up and down Mm -hmm. to the South Bay, you know, they've been having to sort of rejigger their zoning. They don't have as much control since all the properties are individually owned. And I was thinking, um, so Janati, you know, the city of Palo Alto has been doing um, a lot of protection clauses, both here on California Avenue and, and downtown ground floor. Mm -hmm. Retail is one of them. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it started in 2015. Uh, they passed the emergency law, which kind of goes to show how important they think this is mm -hmm. to protect retail. So they passed the first um, retail preservation ordinance. It was after a few businesses that I know you've written about a lot. There's a Bebo, the general copy. Right. <laughs> right. Unless, we mentioned this many, many times. Yeah. So uh, basically, the new law, basically, um, citywide, if you're a, a retailer on the ground floor and you close shop, whoever comes in next has to also be retail. And they've been kind of messing with this for a few years. Earlier this year in February, they made the law permanent and they tweaked it. Mm -hmm. and, and as I mentioned earlier, I feel like every time um, mm -hmm. they discuss this, they realize that there's another new unintended consequence they didn't think about. And, mm -hmm. and there, there still are. I mean, um, you know, there's been pushback from some property owners and from Chamber of Commerce, which is basically saying you can't mm -hmm. just force retail. You can't just take a location that's not very prominently placed and required to be retailed just because it had a retailer in the past. And, and even now, like you have some property owners like the Pet Food Depot, which, you know, last yeah, year yeah. won the Palo Weekly Best Pet Food Store <laughs> in no, town. This is the one near Fry's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and then it closed and the owner is basically saying, you know, yeah, it's retail, but it, it was a warehouse before. Please don't make us do a retail. It doesn't suit itself. Yeah. And there's the, the other questions like mm -hmm. that I mentioned about yoga studios, like, uh, Auto dealerships, yeah. like uh, auto are they service retail? stations. Are, are they? I mean, are they worth keeping? Yeah. Nothing and, against yoga re or auto mechanics. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's one thing to say we like retail, we protect mm -hmm. retail, but when you have the same council person saying we love retail and also saying mm -hmm. university has become a restaurant grotto <laughs> kind mm -hmm. of thing, it's like uh, in it kind general. Makes you wonder what they're weird. talking. What, yeah. what what do we define retail as? Exactly. Such so that it's valuable to. Preserve. And, well, and there's like, unintended consequences. You don't want to just have um, retail move out, say this has to be retail, and then have a place be vacant. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like right, right now the economy is so hot that it hasn't really been a big problem, but mm -hmm. we've written about it in 2009, 2010, the challenges that downtown has been dealing with at the time. Yeah. And I feel like if another recession does hit, this ground protection rule mm -hmm. of the Institute is probably going to be revised again to give uh, property owners some flexibility to fill the spaces. Yeah, there was something that was in uh, your story, Sue, I think it was Hil Hillary Gittleman, who's the planning director for the city of Palo Alto, was suggesting the idea that maybe the rents could be scaled uh, such that the rents at the core are more uh, or higher and those at the fringes are lesser. Um, but, but the city doesn't really have the authority yeah, the to, tell, <laughs> to but, tell landowners what the they market should be charging. That. But I, I do think, and I think Burlingame is a good example of this because they're kind of thinking along the same lines, but it's not so much um, zoning and regulation, which, as you say, you know, you can't really do that. Um, but it, it's more at a pairing. They, they're seeing themselves as a matchmaker. So they're kind of looking at, okay, landlord, you have this space and this space that you have has been vacant for a while, you know, and you'd like to get somebody to come in and maybe we can help you find retailers to fill that space. Mm -hmm. So I think that... Um, retail Yentl. Yeah, you know, <laughs> but this is kind of, you know, I, I think maybe even if they can't regulate the, uh, the cost, there might be other incentives. You know, there mm -hmm. might be carrots rather than sticks that they can, they can do. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they can have... Uh, some better sense if, if the property owner is also wanting to go along with certain things. Like one of the things that came out of 
that's come out of, you know, there was this bricks and mortality meeting that the, that the city put together. It was in, mm -hmm. in uh, July, right, to kind of talk about the dismal state of, of Palo Alto's retail. Just the, the way that, I mean, not, I mean, it looks vibrant on the surface, but there are a lot of people out there that are suffering and co going to Russ Cohen and saying, you know, help me, you know, what do we do? We don't know how to get people. We don't have the foot traffic, you mm -hmm. know. And part of the blame is parking, so that's another issue, you know, which we could go off on that tangent, but we won't today, but, you know. Yeah, <laughs> well, um, Janine and I were talking before um, the webcast, um, and the city doesn't really have any studies that actually show that there's less parking now as opposed to a couple of years ago. So I'm, I'm curious to know what the data is behind that sentiment. Right, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't get into any of that uh, myself with my story. Mm -hmm. But I, I just like to kind of get back to the Redwood City model and, and, and use it almost as a cautionary tale. Um, uh, even though right now it is successful, they are very concerned. I mean, Palo Alto, if you look at Palo Alto, Palo Alto's not doing the building that other cities like Mountain View are doing in terms of, let's say, housing and even office development. Redwood City has gone gung-ho. You know, they've got, mm. I forget how many thousands of units of housing that they're putting in right near their downtown core. Same thing with office space. They've got like four office towers that, they're, that are being built. And along with that, there's a lot of parking. The parking may not be available necessarily. It's underground parking. Not necessarily available during the work week when the offices are there, but when crowds start coming in on the weekend, you'll be able to find a place to to go. Plus, they have more wayfinding that they've added in terms of signage to show people where their underground parking garages are, and that got rid of their parking issue. Because they said people just would go around and around. They only knew one spot, and they'd say, oh, I want to go under the one at the theater. Mm -hmm. It's full. Where else do I go? Yeah. Well, there's one just down the street, you know, that's underneath the, the fire station, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are the kinds of things that they've done. But It's worth noting that Palo Alto is building a new downtown garage now in uh, Hamilton yeah. and Waverly, so hopefully that'll help address this a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah, and the city's going to do a parking study this fall. Or, or yeah, they're, they're going to do traffic counts because yeah. they had the RPP program, so they're going to be testing how that impacted um, you know, people. Downtown spaces. The, the whack-a-mole situation that people <laughs> have been dealing with, and yeah, in general, the yeah. occupancy rates. Yeah. But to, to the idea of if you build it, everybody will come, it's not necessarily so. And that's one of the things, you know, it's really... Uh, the experts talk about the necessary necessity for a mix and the necessity not to just jump on the bandwagon and say, I mean, everybody just wants to put, all these cities I talked to, they said, all that we're getting is people want to put in restaurants and fitness centers, essentially, and there really isn't any other type of interest. Well, um, you know, somebody like Michael Byrne would say, well, maybe because you need to have, you need to have a bigger space available in your downtown to attract um, an anchor store, you know, not a major, huge, humongous mm -hmm. anchor store, but something that will draw people in who will then shop to the smaller shops around it. So, um, you know, I think if you're just looking only at restaurants and or only, uh, you know, the other thing is even with the malls, they're looking at, oh, you know, there's a big demand for office space. So let's turn some of these, you know, the upper stories of, um, in, our, in our shopping centers mm -hmm. into offices. Mm -hmm. And, but the, the cautionary tale is that if you do all of that, you may end up, once again, when the market changes, and it will, uh, you'll end up in the same boat. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a constantly moving target. Yeah. Once you lose retail, it might not come back. If you convert it to office, it's, it's kind of hard to get it back. So there's That's right. And, and the council members would be very tentative to do anything like that, I yeah. imagine, in Palo Alto yeah. and elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a constantly evolving landscape. Um, well, thanks for the update on what's happening in retail, and I know that the city's going to continue chipping away at it to make sure that uh, the retailers are vibrant here in Palo Alto. Um, so thanks for the discussion. All right, well, that wraps us up for another edition of Behind the Headlines. If you liked what you heard, uh, you can subscribe to us below to get notifications of the next webcast. Uh, we are on social media. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And always check out the latest news on paloaltoonline.com. We'll see you next week.